Welcome to Decluttering to Relax. My name is Amber Knoll and I am the Health and Human Sciences Educator for Purdue Extension in Tippecanoe County. I'd like to acknowledge the University of Illinois Extension as well as the University of Florida Extension. Both of these extension services help to provide not only the basis of this presentation, but resources as well. Everyone has their ideal level of simplicity. What matters most is keeping what's essential to you and then getting rid of the rest. We're going to talk about the effects of clutter, some benefits to decluttering, and how to develop a plan to get organized, including some barriers. Keep in mind that everyone lives differently, so the extent to how this will look will vary from person to person and household to household. To get us started, I'd like you to envision your perfectly organized home. Now think about what your space actually looks like. The goal today is to help you get from point A to point B. Living in clutter is not the same as hoarding. Hoarders accumulate and save an excessive number of items that are not needed, gradually build up clutter in all living spaces, and have difficulty discarding things. People with hoarding disorder often have a tendency toward indecisiveness, perfectionism, avoidance, procrastination, and problems with planning and organizing. Hoarding often creates such cramped living conditions that functional living space is severely diminished. Homes may only have narrow pathways that wind through the stacks of stuff. Countertops, sinks, beds, virtually all surfaces are piled with stuff, and that stuff is often junk or trash. Some people may hoard animals. Because of the large number of animals, these animals often aren't cared for properly, and the health and safety of the person and the animals are at risk because of these unsanitary living conditions. People with hoarding disorder may not see it as a problem, which can make treatment challenging. Treatment can help people with hoarding disorder lead safer and more enjoyable lives. Hoarding disorder is different from collecting. People who have collections deliberately search out specific items, categorize them, and carefully display them. Collections may be large, but they usually aren't cluttered and they don't cause the level of distress and impairment that are common with hoarding disorder. Hoarding leads to impaired daily functioning. People who hoard usually cannot sleep, eat, or bathe because of the overwhelming amount of things everywhere. Hoarding can also lead to social isolation, health problems. It can lead to pest infestations in the home and lowered quality of life and longevity. It's estimated that about 5.8% of the general population lives with a hoarding disorder. We have a lot of stressors in our daily life. We all have time limitations and various obligations, and living a cluttered life adds even more stress. There are many effects of clutter, including financial, time, and health effects. There are costs to clutter. If you continually buy more than you need, you divert resources away from your financial goals. Have you ever not been able to find what you're looking for, only to go out and buy another, and then you come home and find what you were originally looking for? Duplication and buying what we already have definitely costs us money. We can miss bills because we can't find them in the piles of paperwork that's everywhere in our house, and those late fees can add up, also costing us money. Time is, an another, time is another effect of clutter. There is never enough time, but searching for what you can't find costs us time. Going out to buy a duplicate of what you think you already have also takes time. There are also physical and mental health implications to clutter. Dealing with other people's stuff laying around can lead to family strife. If you feel like all you do is yell at your kids to clean their room or take things upstairs or wish that your housemates would move their things to their own space, you kind of know what I'm talking about. You may be embarrassed to have people over or your housemates or children may be embarrassed to have people over and that can lead to social seclusion. Your kitchen may be so dirty that you choose not to cook, causing you to eat out. We know that eating out is generally considered to be less healthy than cooking at home, not to mention more expensive. So tying in not only health effects, but also financial effects as well. When you clear the clutter, you gain more control over your life. 
you'll have more time, less stress, be more productive, and reduce your spending. People with less cluttered houses spend 40% less time cleaning them. This means time is gained to do other things, you can find things more easily, and ultimately have lower levels of stress. We're going to hone in on the health effects of clutter. We'll go through each one of these topics more in the coming slides. Falls can happen at any age, but they're more common in kids and older adults. A variety of causes can lead to a fall, but a cluttered home is one of those risk factors. Many things can contribute to your fall risk, but falls can be prevented. Talk to your doctor to help you evaluate your risk of falling. Certain medicines can make you dizzy or sleepy, which can affect your balance. Have your eyes checked annually and incorporate strength and balance exercises into your daily routine. Also think about how you can make your home safer. Clearing the clutter, especially on stairs, helps to get rid of things that could trip you. Toys, magazines, paper, these things all cause a fall that could lead to a serious injury. Think about what you're wearing on your feet. Some shoes have slick soles that make you unsteady on your feet. Slippers and stocks can also lower traction. Do you have throw rugs that don't have a non-slip backing on them? Do you have electrical cords across walkways? If you have blankets or clothes strewn across the floor, or things like tables, chairs, or other furniture obstructing walkways, all of those things can be fall hazards as well. Someone once referred to their pets as furry speed bumps. Know where your pet is sleeping before you start walking to avoid tripping over them. Most of us spend about 90% of our time indoors. We work at a desk, we go home and watch TV, or go to meetings and sit at a table, and then we usually go to bed and that's most likely indoors. The air quality inside all of these places can really affect our quality of life. All of us are vulnerable to indoor air quality, but those particularly sensitive include young kids, older adults, and those with respiratory or cardiovascular concerns, including asthma and COPD. Clutter can not only make it harder to clean your space, but it can also harbor indoor air pollutants. Think about kids that have a ton of stuffed animals. Those stuffed animals sit around collecting dust, or they may go everywhere, including the bathroom with kids. Kids then hold them close to their face when they're snuggling them. They may put them on, in their mouths, or they may sleep on them. These stuffed animals rarely get cleaned or cleaned properly. Whatever that stuffed animal is harboring is getting breathed in by the child. Also think of figurines that are hard to dust, or places that dog or cat hair can fly. Indoor air quality can be really hard to control because of this pet dander and the dust. According to the EPA, some health effects from indoor air pollutants may include irritation of the eyes, nose, and throat, headaches, dizziness, and fatigue. Some diseases may be worsened by indoor air quality, including respiratory diseases, heart diseases, and possibly cancers. Indoor air quality does affect health, but keep in mind that sensitivity to a particular pollutant will vary from person to person based on a variety of reasons, and there is considerable uncertainty about what concentration or period of exposure are necessary to produce specific health problems. To improve your indoor air quality, reduce the number of items in your home that hold pollutants, so talking about decluttering, especially items that may hold dust, smoke, or pet dander. Fibrous things like throw pillows and stuffed animals are example of these things, but if you've ever walked into a house where someone smoked or had animals, you know that that smell can seep into a lot of materials and be really hard to remove. Clean regularly. This helps control the pollutants and can reduce their levels. Replace filters for your vacuum, HVAC system, kitchen exhaust fan, etc. regularly. Consider using a HEPA filter. HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air. A HEPA filter is a type of mechanical air filter. It works by forcing air through a fine mesh that traps harmful particles such as pollen, pet dander, dust mites, and tobacco smoke. 
Cleaning also helps to prevent pest infestations, which cause many health concerns and are unsightly. Work to ventilate your space. Circulate the air and work to bring fresh air in. Don't smoke inside, and if you want help to stop smoking and need some resources, please feel free to email me later. And finally, control water spills and leaks and clean them up promptly. Leaving these things can promote mold and mildew. Mold and mildew are naturally occurring. They can produce allergens, irritants, and in rare cases, toxic substances. If you want more information on indoor air quality, the EPA has a variety of resources. Clutter is distracting. It creates excessive stimuli that puts our senses into overdrive, which makes it hard to relax. Our brain being constantly stimulated can reduce our productivity and creativity. It can affect our sleep, so some people have a really hard time sleeping in a cluttered space, like if clothes are all over the place. Clutter can also create feelings of guilt, anxiety, and frustration, and all of these things come with their own mental toll. Families can also experience more stress when they fight over each other's things and the space they take up, as well as not being able to find anything. If you are your family's finder, so you're the one that everyone comes to when they've lost something or need to know where something is, you know that that can be really hard to sit at home and relax. And it can make you feel like you are the only one that's checked into your family, which can lead to feelings of not being appreciated. Reducing clutter helps to control all of these stimulants and frustrations, which gives us one less thing to worry about. The University of Florida Extensions in their presentation on this topic made a good point of thinking about your office. So if you are having a hard time starting at home, think of your other spaces. So you may build confidence in decluttering when you start somewhere like your office where theoretically everything will have an easy space to find. So offices can say a lot about our as can a home, but build your confidence by starting at your office and then move home. So we've got a couple more slides of the effects of clutter and then we'll go into actually how to tackle that clutter. If you keep a cluttered home, especially a cluttered kitchen, you may be less likely to cook, more likely to throw out uneaten food, and more likely to eat out or eat convenient foods. If your counters are full of stuff, your sink is overflowing with dirty dishes, and your table needs to be unearthed before you can sit down at it, you most likely will not be inspired to cook a healthy meal. If you aren't cooking, you may be heading out to eat. Eating out costs money, you're less likely to consume fruits and vegetables when you eat out, and you're more likely to consume nutrients that we should be limiting in our diets, so things like sugar, sodium, and unhealthy fats. Convenience items like granola bars, chips, and lunch meat can also increase the amount of nutrients that we should be limiting in our diets. Clutter in the kitchen not only makes it harder to cook, but also makes the space harder to clean and disinfect. Dirty kitchens can attract pests, which can lead to food safety concerns. Cleaning your kitchen and keeping it clear of clutter creates a space that may make you want to actually cook or spend time with your family. So especially if you have kids, kids learn a lot in the kitchen and they love spending time with adults in there. So that's a really great place to catch up after a busy day or make some family memories. We know that families who spend time sharing meals together have better connectivity and better physical, mental, and emotional health outcomes as well. Also think about how much food you throw out every week because it was stuffed in the fridge and no one saw it so it went bad or it was hidden in the pantry by all sorts of other foods so it, it's best by date expired or it may be an odd ingredient that you tried in one recipe and then never used again before it expired so you have to throw it out. Feeding America estimates around 72 billion pounds of edible food gets wasted each year. If you can't remember the last time you cleaned out your fridge or organized your pantry, it's worth doing as soon as you can. Overloaded fridges can make air circulation harder, which could promote things sitting at unsafe temperatures that promote bacterial growth and potentially cause a foodborne illness. 
The CDC estimates that each year, 48 million people get sick from a foodborne illness and about 3,000 people die. Unsafe food handling practices add up and make food poisoning more likely. Always follow the four steps of clean, separate, cook, and chill to keep your food as safe as possible. Meal planning is another great tool to help you avoid food waste and utilize the food that you have. It can take some trial and error to find a system that works for you, but you'll notice a difference in the amount of healthy meals eaten, the amount of food waste your family doesn't have, and the amount of extra ingredients that don't accumulate in your pantry when you take time to get organized in the kitchen. We've spent some time talking about the effects of clutter, and now we're going to shift gears to talk about what to actually do with all of your stuff. Stuff can hold you back and can prevent you from moving on with your life. I think a lot about the tiny house movement, and my parents are always talking about downsizing, but they feel like they have too much stuff, so their stuff is holding them back from downsizing. A lot of us are very lucky, lucky to have more than we need, but remember that we are in charge of our material objects. Your stuff doesn't make you who you are, you make you who you are. Like a lot of things, understanding where your stuff came from can help prevent it in the, from accumulating in the future. It can be a combination of too much stuff, a lack of space, either a real lack of space or a perceived lack of space, or poor organizing habits. Some of us have a dump spaces like a junk drawer. And you may be out of space because you have too much stuff, but if you quit delaying the decision of what to do with all of those items, so you decide to donate it or throw it out instead of just putting it in a junk drawer for later, you might find that you have less stuff and more space. Sentimentality can lead to having a lot of things. Consider keeping just one or two items that really mean something. Try to repurpose items, so something like creating a collage of a new piece of art out of smaller pieces of art from your kids. Or I seem to collect a lot of candy dishes from people. They just give me candy dishes, and I've repurposed my favorite ones into a dog treat jar. So instead of that candy dish just sitting around because someone special gave it to me, or donating it and feeling a little bad about it, I now use it every day for dog treats, so it's been repurposed. Also think about if you can give away sentimental items to other family members who may appreciate it, or you could sell or donate it. Getting rid of someone's clothes can be very difficult, but a lot of towns have some sort of nonprofit that do interview training, and they will also take gently used dress clothes to distribute to their patrons. Another idea is if you sell an item that is worth value, you can use that money gained to take that special person who gave you the gift out for some kind of experience, like a trip or going out to dinner. Remember that someday is not a real day on your calendar. A lot of us keep things because we might need it or might want to use it again at some point, but that usually means it just sits around and never gets used. Or when the time comes for it, we can't decide or we can't find it, or we decide we'd rather have something new or more updated. Commercial messaging drives a lot of us to think that we always need the newest and we always need more, which can contribute to our clutter. So think about how many old phones you have sitting in a desk drawer somewhere. Other reasons for the clutter may include hidden mental health concerns, Passive aggression towards someone you live with, so if you feel that your roommate never puts their stuff away or does their dishes, so you just leave it there to see how long it takes them to take care of it, it's really only bothering you. So addressing that underlying issue of talking to your housemate can help avoid that clutter accumulating. It can be really hard to know where to start, but once you've decided to start clearing your clutter, it can be overwhelming, so a lot of us will put it off. There are two general decluttering philosophies, organization and simplicity. Neither is necessarily better than the other. It really comes down to what would work for you. With organization, the goal is that everything has its own place, and this order helps to manage the chaos. If it doesn't have a specific place, then you don't really need it. 
The place can be the junk drawer, but it still has to have a place to go. Simplicity focuses on needs over wants. This is pretty popular right now. A lot of people will promote minimalism as a way of spending less, owning less, and using less resources. So if you're not buying as much, you're not driving around to stores, you're not generating as much trash, things like that. So you're really focusing on what the bare minimum amount of items needed are, and then if you have less, you have less of an opportunity for clutter to accumulate. How to get started, especially if you are feeling overwhelmed, it helps to start with a plan. This can be a list of tasks to do in each room, the order of rooms you're going to go in, whatever. Just make sure that it works for you. Don't go into this blindly, but think about your course of action and then write it down. Remember, we are more likely to do something if we write it down, so write down your goals and how you're going to get there. I always feel better when I make a giant to-do list, so it's a same concept. Envision what you want your space to look like, and if you're not sure, places like Pinterest or Google are full of ideas. Also remember why we want to get organized in the first place. How specifically will your life be improved once this space is organized? Hopefully the first half of our PowerPoint helped you to find your why, and a lot of times it's time management or less stress. The next tip is to start easy. Start with something small like a single drawer of t-shirts or start with what bothers you most, so maybe it's an overflowing closet. Do not start with something hard like a sentimental item, so a box of pictures. You want to build your confidence and start with something you'll be successful in organizing. Sometimes starting in one space like the kitchen counters builds success or starting with one type of thing like magazines or books also helps to build success. Finally, be flexible. Remember that organization is a skill and just like any skill, it needs to be learned. There's no perfect system and finding what works best for you will be a series of trial and error. It can help to change your mindset from choosing what to keep to, or from choosing what to keep to what should I throw out. Remember that you can't force others to be organized, but you can control you. So leading by example and trying not to get discouraged, so sticking with it can really help people in your area, in your space at home, get on board. I put the trans theoretical model of change up here on the slide. My background's in public health and we use this theory a lot when we're talking about adopting or quitting certain health behaviors. So things like sticking to an exercise plan or stopping smoking. Change can be really hard and it's normal to want to change and then adopt the change, maintain it for a little bit and then fall off the wagon and relapse. It may take you a few tries to get organized and that's completely normal. The key is being resilient and sticking with it. So creating your plan. Start by analyzing your space. Think about what bothers you most and be specific. Think about why this space bothers you most. Can you address the root issue? What space is causing the most problems for you or your family? What's actually working in that space? If you've got something like a color coding system that your kids actually follow, then you don't want to abandon that. Think about what's essential to the space. If it's an entryway, getting rid of a place to put your shoes doesn't make a lot of sense. Your next step is to strategize. What do you actually need to do in this space? Is it to clear the clutter or maybe to move someone else's things to their own space or does it just need a good cleaning? Think about what supplies you need. So things like trash bags, boxes for transporting goods to a thrift shop, some kind of organizer like a plastic drawer set. Think about your space before you buy any kind of organizer. Make sure that it'll work for you because otherwise if it doesn't work in that space, it's wasted money and can become more clutter. What order will you go in? Will you go room by room or one category of things at a time? What's your timeline? If you have house guests coming and need to be done by a certain date, keep that in mind when you're being realistic about how much clutter you can organize before your house guests come. And then finally, take action. Make sure you're being realistic, not just on what you're sorting through, but also with time. 
Rooms can take whole days, but make decluttering a priority. Also be realistic about what you're keeping. If it's broken, so you choose to keep something that's broken, ask yourself what it'll take to fix it. If it was really necessary to be fixed, you probably would have either fixed it or replaced it by now. Try making an appointment with yourself on the calendar so that way you can't blow off your organization. And sometimes if you've got a really big task, it helps to set a timer for 60 minutes and work as hard as you can for that hour. But when the timer goes off, you're done until the next day. I like that strategy a lot. I use it for every daunting task. So especially something like weeding the garden, set a 60 minute timer. However much I can get done is that's what I can get done that day. Make sure that you finish one area. So organize one space before moving on to the next space. You want to be successful. When you're working on decluttering, leave technology in a different room. It can be a distraction and can derail you from your task. So if you're sitting there on the phone talking to someone, you're not organizing, you're, been, you're getting distracted by whoever you're talking to. Also be aware of the fact that after you get started, you may need additional supplies or extra help. Sometimes having a neutral third party in the room can help you sort through old clothes or can help rationalize why you're keeping something. So like if you've got clothes from high school that you're hoping to fit in someday, sometimes having a neutral third party can help you realistically think about what steps you would need to make that happen and if you should keep that item for later or go ahead and donate it. So you've identified the space you are going to start in. So let's, for example, say that you are going to start with a closet. Start by removing all items from the closet and putting them into a giant pile. If you've watched the Marie Kondo series on Netflix, these next couple of steps are going to be pretty familiar to you. If you need to clean that space, like vacuum it or dust it, do that now. Next, sort through the items one by one. For each item, choose if you are going to throw it out, recycle it, donate it, sell it in a yard sale or at a consignment shop, or if it needs to be moved to a different location. So like if you find a dinner plate in your closet, that obviously needs to go to the kitchen. Make sure that you are being decisive. Now is the time to actually make a decision about what to do with all of these items. Remember that clutter is a delayed decision. The time for action is now while you are sorting through it. If you don't love it, use it, wear it, or have a dedicated space for it, then it's junk and it needs to be thrown out, recycled, donated, or sold. Finally, for the items you're putting back into the space, do so tidily. We'll talk about storage options over the next few slides, so now it's the time to be organized. As you're doing this, there will be barriers. If you live with other people, you may be frustrated by their stuff. Try to be flexible and to compromise. Remember, organization is learned and there's no one perfect method. A lot of families with kids will do the one in, one out method. So for every one toy you bring home, you have to get rid of one toy you already own. Or they have a set space where that family member can do whatever they want, but it's their space. So like a junk drawer, like you can put whatever you want in your junk drawer, but just get it off the counter. Just remember when you're working with other household members to not expect a miracle. There will inevitably be something you think needs to, needs to go and that they will force you to hang on to. Time is also a barrier. The clutter didn't show up overnight and it certainly won't be organized overnight. Use your plan to break down your goal into manageable tasks and remember that you control your things, they don't control you. Sorting through things can be emotional for a lot of reasons. A lot of memories can be tied to certain items and sometimes a lot of guilt can be associated with getting rid of those items. I can't tell you how to feel, but certainly that isn't how emotions work, but try to separate your emotions from the item. If you received a gift from someone you care about and you really hate it, not using it wasn't the point of them buying it and giving it to you. Try to think creatively about that item. Maybe you could rehome it with someone else or sell it to use that money to take that person out to lunch.
but I guarantee that person wouldn't want you to feel bad about whatever they gave you. As you're sorting your items, you may truly not be able to make a decision on a specific item. If you're stuck, ask yourself these questions. When was the last time I used this? If it's been a while, you can probably get rid of it. Ask yourself if you like it or if it fits. If you don't even like it, then why are you keeping it? If it doesn't actually fit and you aren't making changes in your life to make that closing fit and being realistic about it, then don't keep it. Get rid of it and make room for things that you feel confident wearing that are flattering. Ask yourself if it works. If it doesn't work, will you ever actually fix it? Do you have the skills and time to fix it? Is the item even fixable? Where would you store it? If it doesn't have a designated space, it's clutter. Can you get this item elsewhere? So could you rent it or borrow it? If it's an article, you can get it online. You could maybe go to the library for that information. And then finally, what's the absolute worst thing that could happen if you got rid of that item? Would someone be mad at you? Is it completely irreplaceable for a valid reason? Try rehoming certain things like heirlooms if you really don't want it, but can't bring yourself to fully let go of it. If you really can't decide, store that item away in a place out of the way or out of your usual path. Set a calendar reminder to check back in on that item in three months. If you haven't used it in three months, then it needs to go. So either donated, recycled, trashed, whatever that decision is. At the end of three months, your, main, your mindset may have changed on the item and it may be easier to decide. So you've sorted through your things and now you need to organize what you are actually keeping. As part of your visualization for how your space will look at the very beginning, you may have seen how things were stored. There should be some sort of plan to how things will be stored. Color coding, a designated dump spot, drawers, crates, shelves, whatever. This will look different for different people. Good storage makes caring for your things and caring for your house easier. So it's easier to clean when everything's put away in its own space. This automatically can help lower the stress level and the amount of conflict in the house. Store things at or near the point of use so it's easily found and accessible. If things are used together, try to store them together. So like winter hats and winter gloves, storing them together in the same space instead of separately makes a lot more sense. Consider accessibility when storing things. Don't store something like your kids Legos on a shelf that's too high for them to reach. Make sure that if it's needed regularly, it's easy to see, easy to reach, and easy to put back in its place when you're done with it. Store your things in a way that protects them. If you have your grandma's china, for example, store it in a way where kids running around being rowdy won't break that china. If you keep things like firearms in the house, make sure that you store them in a way that protect your family member as well. My other favorite example for this one is kitchen knives. So they should be somewhere safe like a knife block or a storage case, not just floating around in your drawer. This protects not only whoever is going through your kitchen drawers, but it also keeps your knives from dulling. Finally, be creative and flexible as you work around your family's changing needs and activities. Use all available spaces. Look up, down, underneath things. They make all sorts of storage devices that you can hang from the rafters in your garage or basement. People will convert the dead space under their stairs into some kind of storage or living space, so just consider all of your options. This is another great place where Pinterest or Google could come in handy. A note about off-site storage. Carefully consider the costs of paying a facility to store your things off-site. Definitely know why you're storing these things. If it's temporary because you are in the middle of moving, that's one thing. But if you don't have an end date in place before you put these items in a storage unit, then make it a priority to go through what you're actually storing there. Remember to carefully wrap and label all items to protect them. Take an inventory and include all pertinent information like serial numbers and consider insuring your storage unit. 
Also take pictures to keep with your inventory list. This will help you identify what's missing or what's damaged should something occur. Once you've taken the time to get organized, don't let clutter sneak back in. So for example, people will randomly buy clothes for special occasions, but how many special occasion outfits do you really need? When that occasion shows up, are you going to want something completely new because the fashions have changed or maybe you're a different size? All of this buying costs money. Think about alternatives like renting or buying gently used items. Make sure you're only storing things you really need, and that includes for bringing new things in. Think about when you are going to use it and if you even have room to store it. Couponing was really big a few years ago, but if you don't have space to store 90 packs of paper towel or 130 tubes of toothpaste, then it's really not making sense for you. If you've saved $3, but you're out of living space, it's not really saving you that much. The same thing with things that expire. So even things like toothpaste or mouthwash will have some sort of expiration date. If you aren't going to use it before it expires, then it doesn't make sense to buy that item in bulk. It's only becoming clutter or trash. When you throw things out because they've expired, you're still wasting money. Date things that have an expiration date like kitchen spices. Anything more than a year old needs to be disposed of, especially when it's been opened. When you buy things, think about how often you're really going to use it and that helps you avoid that clutter sneaking back in, especially in your kitchen. Try to avoid duplicates. Have a backup if it's something you use a lot, like having two bags of coffee so you're using one and then you have a backup, a backup in case you run out in the middle of the week, but don't just have a ton of extra things sitting around. And for things like tools especially, so you really probably only need one hammer, so avoid duplicates. Also work to avoid freebies. Those goodie bags at health fairs with all the stress balls in them usually just become some sort of junk and you can say no, you won't take one. Try to avoid hand-me-downs if you're not interested in them. If you're really going to use it, that's great, but don't let people just give you stuff that they don't want because if you don't have the space for it and you're not going to use it, then it's not only something that you don't want, but it's clutter. Question receiving family heirlooms. If it's just old stuff with no sentimental value, then it's junk. Remember that you can pick one or two things of value and then get rid of the rest. I also know a lot of people who go to garage sales and pick things up that would be cool if they were cleaned or fixed or repaired or whatever it is, but if you aren't really going to fix it and use it, then it's just junk. Remember, if we are thinking of organizing, then everything needs some kind of place. So to summarize our presentation, a clutter-free life is less stressful. Clutter is a visual distraction and can cause mental stress, as well as it can make doing what you need to get done harder than it needs to be. Living clutter-free is more efficient. Your space is more peaceful and attractive. It can also help save you time and money. However you choose to get rid of your clutter and organize your life, your life is great. There's no one perfect method. Always remember what your goal is. Is your goal to live in a museum? If yes, that's perfectly okay. If your goal is to have a functional space that works for your family but is manageable, that's great too. So organization will look completely different for every single person. If you're stuck, start small like with a sock drawer or start with a place that bothers you most like under the bathroom sink. Make sure to do the sentimental items last. You may need to be flexible and change your goal as you go along and that's okay. Accept reality. Sometimes your house won't look exactly how you think it should, but if it's better than before, that's what you're going for. Remember that these things take time. If you start to notice that the clutter is creeping back in, you can always start over again. If you need help with your space and think that you may need a professional, the National Association of Productivity and Organizing can help you find someone.
who can help you. The Library of Congress has a whole section on their website dedicated to preserving items. They have resources on storing photos, caring for wet books, managing digital collections, all sort of things. They are a really great resource. For those local in Tippecanoe County, the Tippecanoe County Solid Waste Management Districts put out an A to Z guide on recycling. It has information on how to dispose of old paint, things like old fridges, clothing, DVDs, all sorts of things. The University of Illinois also has a website about dealing with your clutter and goes into depth about organizing your financial records, places like your kitchen, organizing your kid stuff, and helped inform this presentation as well. Thank you for joining me today for Decluttering to Relax. Should you have any questions about this presentation or need some additional resources, feel free to email me. You can see my email on the slide. Thanks for joining me.